This is The Meeting House with Dwight A. Moody. News, reviews, commentary, and conversation on religion and American life. Now, here is Dr. Moody. And good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Meeting House, where we have conversation on religion and American life. We're delighted that you've joined us. Whether you're watching on the radio in South Georgia or through the social media networks, of the Meeting House or St. Stephen's Baptist Church of Louisville, Kentucky. We're delighted that you've joined us for this uh, summary of the news and religion of, in American life and conversation with two very interesting people, both of whom have been in the Meeting House before. Um, they both live in Baton Rouge. They have, each of them has a story one about addiction and recovery, and the other about a journey from Baptist to Catholic, and how all these stories are related. They are a daughter and father. And it was just about a year ago that I introduced and had a conversation with Lauren Ellis DeWitt, and she's back with me today with her father, a longtime friend of mine, Dr. Terry Ellis. He's written a book, entitled Reasonably Happy, with a long subtitle. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. I've read the book and reviewed it on my website at themeetinghouse.net, and I encourage you to, to go there and read that review. As always, we start our program with the news. I have five stories on religion and American life today, and we're going to start uh, out in Dallas, Texas, but the news is always brought to you by our sponsor, Perfecto Coffee of California, perfectocoffeeinc.com. You can order your coffee from them. I will be sending to each of my guests today a package of their coffee as uh, my uh, thanks for being on the show today. Today, we start with the news out in Dallas, Texas. The facts about church attendance before, during, and after the pandemic have now been tabulated, calculated, and now they've been published. Baptist News Global of Dallas, Texas rounded up all of these statistics, published a summary article demonstrating that church attendance in general has decreased about 7% over the last two years. Those most likely to avoid worship now are the young and the old, plus the middle-aged, married, and without children, that demographic. Those who say they attend once or twice a month has decreased from 34% in 2019 to 21% in 2020 to 28% in 2021. Those who say they never attend religious service increased by the same proportions nat nationally from 50% in 2019 up to 57% in 2021. Those who confess going just a few times a year has stayed pretty steady, 13%, 13%, and this year or last year, 2021, 12%. Let's go to Washington, D.C., where? Thousands of marchers turned out in Washington, D.C. last weekend for the 2022 edition of the March for Life. Quote, we want the Supreme Court to overturn Roe v. Wade, one young marcher said. This is what the country wants, end quote. Signs touting, I am the post-Roe generation were carried largely by students attending Catholic universities such as Fordham University in New York. Quote, we are not here to shame women and bring more hatred and sadness into an already sad world, one marcher said. We want to show we care for every single person, end quote. The pandemic and the weather conspired to keep the attendance at the march lower than normal, even as the marchers and the country anticipates the ruling of the newly conservative and strongly Catholic Supreme Court. Out in Los Angeles, 
the American Christian Organization Open Doors of Santa Ana, California, has released their annual statistics about places in the world where it's most difficult and dangerous to live as a Christian. Afghanistan, for the first time, tops the list this year. The first time that some country other than North Korea has been at the top. But since Afghanistan's takeover by the Taliban last August, Afghan believers have had to leave the country or relocate internally or go underground completely. Quote, overall, 360 million Christians live in nations with high levels of persecution or discrimination, the report stated. That's one in seven Christians worldwide, including one in five believers in Af Africa, two in five in Asia, and one in 15 in Latin America. In Philadelphia, two prominent Christian artists make the news this week. Brady Goodwin, known as Fanatic, founding member of the Grammy-nominated Christian hip-hop group The Cross Movement, The Cross Movement, and in recent years, an apologetics teacher stated Monday in a video posted online that he had renounced his Christian faith. He sent a letter to his church withdrawing his membership. And another artist, Grammy-winning hip-hop artist Lecrae, says he lost an upcoming show performance after expressing his thoughts about Christianity in a tweet. Quote, once upon a time, I thought I was done with Christianity, he tweeted on January 19th. But the reality was I was just done with the institutionalized, corporatized, gentrified, politicized, culturally exclusive version of it, end quote. I think we're all tempted to give up that kind of Christianity. And from Lexington, Kentucky, <clears throat> my hometown, the American Spiritual Ensemble lost, launched their annual winter tour traveling to North Carolina and Georgia. Formed in 1995 under the vision and direction of Dr. Everett McCorvey, the group travels the country and the world singing the Negro spiritual. <clears throat> Quote, there are, are at least 6,000 songs or tunes that arose in the fields and churches of the enslaved peoples of the American South, he said in a concert in Asheville, North Carolina this week, which I attended and heard him speak these words. McCorvey is director of the opera program at the University of Kentucky, as well as the National Chorale in New York City. On tour this year are 20 vocalists, mostly black, but all highly trained, two instrumentalists, including Tedron Blair Lindsay. Some car concerts are free and some require admission. More information, go to their website at theamericanspiritualensemble.com. All this news is brought to you by Perfecto Coffee, Perfecto Coffee, Inc., of California. You can order your coffee from there. Now here is a, a short clip from an American Spiritual Ensemble promotional piece made a couple of years ago. Uh, let's take a minute and enjoy this. I had noticed a trend in churches, in schools, uh, a trend toward gospel music um, and music, praise music and music that was more of a pop idiom and the traditional, the classical spirituals were really being lost and so I decided to form this group as a way of preserving the classical, traditional Negro spiritual. Be uplifted and transported by the American Spiritual Ensemble, founded by Everett McCorvey in 1995. I mean, there is moans, it's groans, it's feelings, it's pain, it's passion. The spiritual is, is a phenomenon that I don't think we'll ever really know where it came from, but we know it came out of pain. 
and that it's looking for love. Composed of some of the finest singers in the classical music world, they have received worldwide accolades for their transformative renditions of classical spirituals, jazz, and Broadway favorites. With sumptuous power, energy, and commitment, their spirited performances focus on preserving and highlighting the black experience. American Spiritual Ensemble, Friday, January 31st in the Concert Hall. That was a promotional piece for the American Spiritual Ensemble, singing in part their theme music, Don't You Get Weary, There's a Great Camp Meeting in the Promised Land. Walk Together Children, Don't You Get Weary, There's a Great Camp Meeting in the Promised Land. I've heard them sing many, many times, including just this week. They were performing in Asheville, North Carolina, and I was there to greet them. I know many in the group, and it's a, one of the most powerful um, concerts you can possibly go to. So if they come near your place, uh, I don't know whether they ever go down to Louisiana. We'll talk about that in just a minute because both of my guests today are in um uh, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Lauren DeWitt and Terry Ellis. Lauren is a director of Christian formation at Our Lady of Peace, Our Lady of Mercy Catholic Church of Baton Rouge. She's also a lawyer and she's here with her father, Dr. Terry Ellis, longtime Baptist pastor and founder now of a new ministry, Chrysalis Interventions. He also has a new book, Reasonably Happy, how the serenity prayer can help you stop fighting, accept life, and discover the happiness God created you for. That may be the longest subtitle I've ever seen on a book. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to the meeting house, both of you, Lauren and Terry. Thank, Thank you, Dwight. You. It's good to be here. Thank you for inviting us. I remember very much our, our conversations uh, when we talked over the last uh, year, Lauren, it was just a year ago, uh, January 2021, when you came on the show and talked about your journey growing up in the home of a Baptist preacher through college, the crises in your own life, your discovery of the rosary. And I was so fascinated by this story. I can't tell you how many times I have recounted this story to people. Uh, and how this, uh, your engagement with the rosary led to your conversion to, uh, as we say, be received into the Roman Catholic Church. So I want to ask you about this. Um, I have an aunt who may be listening today, by the way, who grew up in the home of a Baptist preacher, married a Baptist preacher who was tragically killed in an accident in Mayfield, Kentucky, 1969, when I was a college freshman. She later married a Jew and converted to Judaism. But then this is what she said to me. When I converted, I had to leave behind nothing of importance to me. And she and I have talked about that. I wonder how you would respond to a statement like that, Lauren. I suppose it would just depend on how you defined uh, importance and whether you were defining it from the uh, general secular idea or the idea um, of what truly is important, the truth that we find in God and the Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, from a secular standpoint, I think I gave up a lot of things of importance. I, um, I was an attorney at one of the top law firms in the Southeast. It actually has a national presence, making six figures plus a year um, on partnership track. I left that after my conversion. I changed um, the way I thought about my marriage, the way we planned our family, uh, the way we were raising our children, the ways we decided to school our children. The way I eat is differently now. Um, the way I dress, the things that I listen to, music, books, media, every there's not a single part of my life that is not uh, just about 180 degrees different from what it was five years ago. Wow. Uh, do I feel like I've given up anything of importance? If you'd asked me in, or if you told me in 2015 
that this is what my life would look like now, I would say I was nuts and I had given up everything that uh, made a lot of sense in the world. But, you know, asking me that today, I haven't given up anything of importance at all. You've probably embraced a lot of things that you now consider so vitally important. Absolutely. I remember our conversation uh, a year ago, you talked about the hard things mm -hmm. of uh, your new faith. And um, I, I wanted to do a whole program just on that idea. Yeah. And uh, we may uh, get to some of it here today. You're now counseling and coaching people who, like yourself, are on the journey to Rome, so to speak. How did your experience prepare you for this? It's funny. I have no um, real theological training other than a few master's courses that I've been able to fit in here and there in between my my busy schedule as a wife, mother, and um, you know the other things that I do. But uh, I think when you begin pursuing a life of radical detachment from things of the world and radical attachment to the things of God, um, he provides everything you need, right? To tell you and to, uh, to prompt you and to tell you what to speak and say and do. And so I, I find that as I have uh, detached more and relied more on him, it comes very easily in talking to others. And, mm. you know, I think our own lives are always going to be the greatest testament. Jesus always worked through people when he was here on earth. That's how it always worked from the beginning of time. And it's how it continues to work now. And so it makes sense that he would work uh, in a special way through our own personal experiences to teach others about him and bring them to him. And so um, I think my experience has helped a lot. Just coming from a Protestant background, I'm able to anticipate a lot of questions that potential Catholic converts may have. Um, having lived a wildly uh, bohemian lifestyle <laughs> for a time there when I was not uh, practicing my faith, I can answer a lot of questions that agnostics or atheists or, um, you know, people who may not be interested in institutionalized religion may have. So I think um, God has blessed and used the many broken parts of my past and, and, you know, the parts that aren't broken as well. He uses everything we give him and it's all been helpful and uh, necessary. Lauren, you know, and I shared some of the statistics earlier in my report of the news the statistics for religion in America are sobering. People are leaving the church, all churches, but I might note that uh, the statistics show that far fewer people are leaving the Catholic church than are leaving all other forms of Christianity in America. Were you aware of this? I wasn't. I knew of the general trends. I didn't realize that Catholicism was slightly better off in the general downward trend. <laughs> yes, it, it seems to be in some sense exempt uh, from the uh, the defections that have hurt especially liberal Protestantism and in more recent years, evangelical, the evangelical world and the Pentecostal world. Uh, the statistics for the Catholic Church has stayed kind of constant. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I, I wonder, in your work with converts, um, I assume many of these are people who are coming from other forms of the Christian community. Uh, some of them. This year, I actually have a Buddhist and a former practicing pagan that are in my class. Um, but by and large, most of them are coming from mainline Protestant backgrounds. Right. All right. What is a what is a practicing pagan? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that That's a really large umbrella term. There's a lot of nature worship, some... Uh, can involve Wicca, um, just general, uh, sometimes they take things from Eastern spiritualities and repackage them. So it, it's, it can be pretty much whatever you want it to be. Pretty uh, you know, I've, I've had, I've always had a lot of practicing pagans in every church that I've right. passed. Yeah. <laughs> right Some of them were deacons. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I, I want you to say just a word again about the rosary, because I, I remember we us talking about that a year ago, as I mentioned earlier. How did you first come upon the rosary and use it, uh, as I recall, in secret? Yes, 
I, I did not want my husband to find out that I was praying the rosary. Uh, so I first came on the rosary. Uh, last time I was on here, I talked a lot about um, trauma that I had uh, basically committed to myself by my lifestyle choices. Um, you know, heavy drinking, occasional drug use, an out of wedlock, pregnancy, all that sort of thing. And so I had a lot of uh, PTSD, extreme depression, severe anxiety. Um, and so I was seeking uh, secular counseling at that time. And this is all, you know, I'm, I'm now this, I think my husband and I were attending the Methodist church at this time. So I'd been back to church because I'd had my daughter and we were going pretty much every Sunday because I wanted her to have a stable moral community to be raised in. Um, but my therapist suggested meditation and mindfulness techniques. And so I actually had a set of mala beads, um, which are prayer beads that are used in um, Hinduism, I believe. But I didn't feel comfortable with it. I did not feel comfortable um, with the mindfulness technique or the using the mala beads. And I tried to repackage it in a sort of a Christian way and make it a prayer, but something about it didn't feel right to me. And that's when I remembered that Catholics have this rosary. And um, I honestly did not know if anybody still prayed a rosary or if that was just some vestige from the Middle Ages. I had a, one of my best friends at the law firm I was working at uh, was a Catholic. And so I asked her, I was like, do you, you know anything about the rosary? Do you all pray it? And she laughed and she's like, yeah, I pray the rosary quite frequently. Um, and I told her, I was like, well, I'm just, I'm really struggling with anxiety and my mind just running away from me. And I need a way to just anchor myself on what's real and what matters and to try to stop these thoughts running away in my head. I was too afraid, though, to go into a Catholic bookstore and buy a rosary myself because <laughs> I thought they would know I was some kind of like, I don't know, heretic fraud or something. <laughs> they could spot you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. They, uh, they could figure you out and blow your cover. Right. So she she brought me a rosary, um, which was from I believe it was from Fatima, which is uh, the Blessed Mother appeared to three children in Portugal. Um, in the early 1900s, and she had gone on a pilgrimage there and gotten a rosary, and she gave it to me. And I looked it up, looked up how to pray it, and I started praying it very uh, timidly at first. And I remember very specifically telling God, like, if this offends you, um, please forgive me. I'm just trying to figure out how to get closer to you, and I'm, I'm trying anything I can. Now, and wait a minute. You said to God in a prayer, God, if this offends you, <laughs> forgive me. I was worried it was, uh, you know, there's so many stereotypes that Catholic pray or where they worship saints um, or they do too much with the Blessed Mother and that sort of thing. And, I, you know, I said, I, this it seems like a better option than the mala beads because at least your name is involved. Um, <laughs> I say Jesus several times in their scripture verses. So I'm trying this, but if it's wrong and heretical, just please forgive me and let me know. Um, so I want to ask you, when are you going to write your book? <laughs> as soon as my children are uh, maybe all potty trained. <laughs> <laughs> when your children are potty trained, even that ought to be in the book, you know. And you want to start your book with that sentence. Now that my kids are potty trained, I have a story to tell you. <laughs> Well, uh, so tell me about what year this happened. This would have been 2016. Um, so I want to ask your father, to, in 2016, what was going on in your life in 2016? Why that was the year I'd actually begun Chrysalis Interventions in 2015. So in 2016, I was not no longer a Baptist pastor, uh, still a obviously a practicing Christian, but not a pastor. And I was uh, you know, doing interventions and getting accreditation and, uh, and, and getting that business up and started. One of the things that you talk about in your book, Reasonably Happy, which I think is such a terrific title, Terry, it is it is kind of an understated title. Um, it doesn't overpromise things. Um, and in that sense, sends a, a signal that this is, this book is in touch with reality and not fantasy. 
that that's the way I encountered the just the title of the book, um, which I, I think is a is a real tribute to you. But in the book, you talk about the role of life events, especially traumatic life events, in triggering addiction. And you mention one event in particular. Tell us about that. Well, let me think now. The event uh, that I that really. I connected and uh, really kind of launched me into full addiction was the murder of my brother. Yes, this is what you talk. This is what is mentioned in the book. Yeah, right. right. Ken was my big brother, eight years older. Uh, so he was everything that a big brother should be in terms of big and strong. And uh, dad had multiple sclerosis. He was not able to run and wrestle and, and do some of the things that dads normally do with uh, their sons. Ken was able to do that. And so he filled a large role in my life. We weren't really, and it may sound a lot, we weren't particularly close because there's a big age difference there. And by the time I kind of came of age, he had gone some other directions in life and kind of pulling away from the family, but still he was my big brother and I loved him and respected him greatly. And he was just uh, murdered as a kind of gang right in, um, in Bradenton, Florida. Yeah. And uh, it was your therapist who helped you explore the connection between that event and your own addiction. Uh, do you still find that a, a compelling connection? Oh, absolutely. And it's interesting, Dwight, there's so many angles on this to explore. Uh, we men are not good at making those connections emotionally and really being willing to dig into some of these traumas and some of our feelings. I had been in treatment for my alcoholism for several weeks before I even mentioned Ken's death. You know? Right. So, I mean, and that's the kind of thing you need to get out. We need to know when we're counseling people, working with uh, folks in uh, recovery, I want to know, uh, you get all the garbage out. I want all the ugly stuff. I got to find out about that. We got to talk about it. So I'm three weeks into recovery or three weeks into treatment. And I had not even mentioned that. And I happened to mention it kind of in passing in small group. And my counselor said, wait, what? And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, my brother, my brother was murdered. And the other people in the small group are, are looking at me quizzically. And, and Philip, my lead therapist, said, is this the first time we're hearing this? And I said, well, I, I, I suppose so. And he began to explore and press on that. And I had never really grieved Ken's death. I took care of things. When he died, like we do as ministers, right, Dwight? We're going to go in there. Yeah. We're going to arrange things. We're going to lead the funeral. We're going to handle yeah. press. And, and, and yeah. you know, in this case, it was a very high-profile murder. And uh, I just really had never processed that. So finally, Philip said to me, he said, Terry, when did you start drinking? And I said, well, it was, it was April uh, 20, 2012. And he said, when was Ken murdered? Or it was April 20, 2011. And he said, when was Ken murdered? And I said, it was March 2011. So it was one month be before I started drinking. And uh, I never made that connection. Mm -hmm. But it was obviously very, very clearly connected. Well, of course, I'm also interested in the connection of your two stories, your story with Lauren's story, she was going through her own trauma sure. uh, at this very same time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, have you, have the two of you explored this? Oh, deeply. <laughs> <laughs> deeply. That whole yeah. blog about it. <laughs> it's been very interesting too. I, yeah. When your child is hurting and, uh, and, and you know, she's very, She's as forthright about the kind of things that she faced as I have been forthright about the kind of things I faced. Yes. So even when, already on this, ground, on this program. Yeah. Right. Not, not necessarily breaking new ground here, but when you see a child, your child going through these terribly difficult times, some of them very much self-inflicted mm -hmm. and you're powerless as a father to say, and you're not, and you're not always handling it well as a father, right? I'm trying to be very self-directing and the strong father and she's, not wanting any of that. She certainly isn't wanting any of the spiritual stuff. So you are, yeah, it was a broken heart that I carried for years with that. That was a real yeah. issue. Now, I do want to follow up on this, Lloyd Dwight, because it's important. Lauren has asked me uh, in, in a moment of, of uh, you know, just reflective. She said, did I cause your alcoholism? Yeah. And I said, Lauren, no one causes alcoholism. Yeah. You can't make somebody. 
Uh, I said, it's just the way, you know, it, it was just something, it was just one of us, several threads that kind of gave rise to an expression in my life that was very negative, but no. Well, this, this is the very, this is the very question that I had in reading the book after hearing uh, Lauren's story a year ago. And I, I read your story. I, I just, that was the very first question I had. What is the connection between Lauren's narrative and your narrative? And uh, have the two of you talked about this? And obviously you have. Um, and of course, it made me reflect on my own life, to tell you the truth. As you know, we have addiction in our own um, family of origin, uh, my, my, my children. And uh, we've had to wrestle with all of this. And we know firsthand how things that happen to one person uh, rock the boat that everybody is in. And uh, I think this is one of the most uh, important parts of this story that how um, the changes in our life for good or bad uh, are impacted by the, the things that happen to other people who are close to us. Um, your way out of it or your response to it, uh, Terry, was um, rehab and uh, giving up your pastoral work and launching a new business, going in a whole new direction, or at least a substantially new, new direction. Lauren, you did the same, didn't you? You you gave up an awful lot that had controlled your life and going in a new direction. Right. Yeah, I think both of us have experienced, you know, pain can lead to progress. Uh, there is this concept of redemptive suffering, uh, which is particularly, I think, strong Catholic theology. But it's the idea that suffering can be a very redemptive experience if you handle it right. Now, you know, addiction is an incredibly isolating experience. Yes, it, it is. is. It is exactly what uh, Augustine said when he talked about sin as being a curving in on the self. There is nothing yeah. that uh, magnifies that more than addiction. It is a very isolating kind of, uh, of event. And so, you know, I, when all these bad things were coming in, in my life, I decided to drink as a way to just try to cope a little bit with that. I had no idea that I was waking up a monster in my head. There is that a physiological component, that neurological component of addiction where, uh, you know, I, I didn't know I had that. Uh, since I have learned my family of origin, uh, there's addiction on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And so I just had that and I didn't write, I didn't wake it up until I was 53 years old. Yeah. And it was there. And so, you know, what I say is, is this, and it's, it's important. At the core of all addictions lies a spiritual void. There's no doubt about that. And that spiritual void is, I would say, always caused by some measure of trauma that's been missing. Yeah. Well, you know, another reason I was so interested in your book, and, you know, I, I read it straight through. It, it is a very readable book. It's a very interesting book. It deals with um, a problem, even the addiction issue, which is kind of the presenting issue that you deal with. But I want to say this. You frame the issue of happiness in a way that stretches far and wide beyond addiction. Uh, even people who are not dealing with addiction uh, in their lives, but who are dealing with other issues, health issues, family issues, political issues, social issues, uh, um, can find their way to happiness using this equation that this philosophy that you you put in the book uh, can help you stop fighting almost anything. Why that's right. It's it's a very uh, a very good insight. People have asked me what the book about is it about addiction? No, not really. No, it's, it's not. Addiction. It's about my addiction. My story was what brought me to this prayer and becomes an illustration of how the prayer and the concepts of theology in the prayer can help you out. When people ask me now what the book is about, I say it's about your pain. And yeah. You're your pain. And my pain may not be connected to addiction at all. Uh, and I, I think moving from our point of pain and the, the two of you have very different uh, 
descriptions of the pain in your life and and how you moved away from it into something new and to find happiness uh, to accept life uh, on its own terms and discover the happiness God created for you. I think both of you have have this testimony. So that's why I'm looking, you know, for volume two of this book. Um, Terry, you can write the forward to it, I, I guess. And uh, uh, because I, I, Lauren, I think your story is every bit as fascinating. Um, and I, I do hope at, at, at some point, um uh you can you can you can put this in in a book form um i do want to clarify as a matter of full disclosure uh, terry that you and i've been friends for a long time i'm not sure when you first came to murray uh what year would would that have been uh 1996 that's when we met Nin 1996 uh, and my dad was still there for a couple of years on your ministry uh, team, wasn't he? Yes. Uh, and and Lauren, uh, you were a teenager during those those Murray years. No, I was in uh, late elementary school. Okay. So well, I, that's when I moved to Murray. When I was in late elementary school, and um, uh, you know, Murray was the shaping the uh, influence of my whole life. Uh, everything that my life became happened right there in Murray, six years that we spent in Murray. Uh, Terry, how long were, were you in Murray? Three years. Uh, and But it, it still resonates with me. In fact, I'll be going back there February 20th for a, a, an event connected with the book and speaking there. So Murray is, is very significant in my life, too. I love that church. I love the community. Well, you know, I'm going back. I believe it's September. I know this is kind of going far afield here, but uh, when I was there as as a young teenager, there was a youth revival in the church in the whole town that lasted about two years. And those of us who were involved in that are having a reunion. I think it's going to be in September, September 8 and 9, um, to go back to the place that was the source of life and hope and happiness for many of us. Um, uh, right there at, at Murray. Um, we're living through traumatic times in the nation. Um, both of you, uh, one dealing with conversion, religious con conversion and formation, the other uh, dealing with um, uh, addiction and uh, find, finding happiness. Uh, what impact, you know, I think about the, the pandemic, I think about the decline in church stuff, and then I think about the political divisions and in, 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 in racial and social. How are these things impacting what each of you is trying to do in the ministry to which you've been called? Well, I mean, the, the effects of the pandemic and um just societal upheavals that we've had, I feel like since 2015, 16, can't be understated. They affect everyone, mm -hmm. regardless mm -hmm. of race, class, socioeconomic status, education background. And everyone's trying to grapple um, with this uh, thing. I think Bishop Barron said a few years ago that we, we need a national examination of conscience. And I think we're getting to that point where people they're, they're sort of, they come to this line in the sand and they're saying, you know, what we're doing right now isn't working. And so we've, you're seeing this splintering and some people are coming into the church, many are leaving it, but it really is a demarcation period, I think, in our national history um, and worldwide for that matter. It's the way that we're going to choose to respond to it that's going to make all the difference though. And um, there is not a single event, personal, uh, national, global, that God cannot use to bring good, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, brought our redemption out of the worst event in human history, the crucifixion of God himself. And so the way we choose to use these events and upheavals are going to change the tra trajectory of everything. And so yeah. that's a big part of my ministry is trying to get people to say, it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life right now. You have very little control. The only thing you have control over is how you decide to respond to it. And What's helped me is by responding totally with my complete and total fiat, my yes to God. 
Um, and so if you want to know how to do that, I'll help you. <laughs> well, I think, you know, you face a challenge that every minister of every tradition deals with. Uh, we're, you're trying to help people come into the church, but you're also trying to form them so that they're not going to go out in the back door of the church when some crisis hits or uh, when they get con confused about things. Um, what is the key to that, uh, to keeping these converts that you're, you're helping? It's a radical relationship with Jesus Christ is what it boils down to. The nothing else matters. He is the center of all human history. And if it does not matter what prayers you say, what devotions you practice, what you do dress or say, if you don't have that personal relationship with him and you don't spend time daily with him in very deep personal prayer, it's, you're not going to make it. And so you know that, what you, you know what you sound like, don't you? I sound like a Baptist, don't I? You sound like a Baptist there. And <laughs> I would say it's, it's hard to get a little more personal relationship with Jesus than consuming him physically in the Eucharist. Though, <laughs> well, right? that you know, is true. That, that, so let, let me ask you the same question that uh, bubbled up in my mind when I was reading Terry's book. What, uh, you know, we don't want to present uh, recovery from addiction or conversion to a new re religion as solely an individual thing. What communal practices help protect people and and form people and uh, strengthen people so right. that it's, it's so that it's not just an individual thing out there. Right. Um, and you and dad touched on this earlier when you were talking about how one person's trauma in the family affects everybody. And that, that's just Christian. That's gospel, isn't it? We're all members of the body of Christ. There is no single sin or virtue for that matter that takes place in a vacuum. It always has an equal and opposite effect on the entire body of Christ as a whole. So it is so important that we realize that as a col collective member of individuals in the body of Christ, that we have a real way to um, impact and help those that are on the margins, right? Whether it be addiction or um, poverty, whatever, whatever marginalized issue you're talking about, we have a duty and a responsibility. And so banding together in right worship, in creating communities that um, foster family life and that uplift every member that are, you know, the early Christian church in Acts 1, um, having everything in common and just realizing that there is not a single thing that can happen to one of us that won't redound in some way to the others. And so the more we can figure out how to collectively support each other and to live moral lives, to live lives of prayer and worship and to center our lives around Christ and the cross, um, that's what's going to make the difference. Uh, uh, Terry, uh well, just one comment, uh, Lauren. I, the two practices that I am most interested in are eating together. And I don't mean communion, although the Lord's Supper could be part of it, but just eating together as families and as friends and as networks, and then singing together. Uh, these are two things that I am vitally interested in as kind of community practices uh, along this re re regard. Terry, you also are doing critical work in this these crazy times in, in which we live. What, are, what is the impact of all this division in the country and political and social cultural division on your work? What do, what do you see? Well, that you combine that with the COVID fears and uh, fear drives a lot of addiction, right? So it's hmm. seeing a lot of isolation, right? Either quarantining or more of a kind of uh, just, uh, just you know, you know, for all the, the good that social media can do, it's also a very isolating event, if not used quite consciously. So people in isolation uh, are vulnerable in ways that they don't recognize. You throw into that a kind of do-it-yourself mentality for all things in life, and you've got a recipe for people to get very sick who mm -hmm. have often jettisoned the metaphysical, right? Mm -hmm. they, talk about God, they, they, they believe in self, all this kind of thing. So isolation is a, uh, 
a real key quality of addiction and community is the key uh, to the solution to, to recover. You've got to get involved with people. I, I don't, I, I, I don't recommend anyone try this alone in terms of recovery. Mm -hmm. You've got to have a group. You've got to have people you're connected to. So we're seeing, you know, to ramble on just a little bit here, but we're seeing uh, a downtick in all the mental health metrics. Mm -hmm. More depression, uh, young More people. More suicide. Right, absolutely. It is, More going, suicide. it is just so disturbing. And you're seeing... Um, uh, the addiction rise tremendously. I, I'm, I'm running into trouble occasionally getting my patients into treatment centers because they're so full. And now they always work with me and, you know, they, they share the same concern for the human being, but it's, we've never had it like this before. You know, listening to both of you talk, especially Terry, about isolation, uh, I can't help but think about uh, how desperate people are to go to ball games. Uh, we, we think of it primarily as an athletic thing, but really it's just a gathering of people, um, uh, people sitting together, yelling t together, cheering, to getting out of their isolation into a, a larger group. The same function uh, perhaps by concerts, uh, especially where uh, people are encouraged to sing along. Um, I was I went to the American Spiritual Ensembles concert Wednesday night. I, for the first time ever, I had to show my vaccination card to get into an event. We had to wear a mask the whole time, but the but the amphitheater or the the concert hall was full of people just wanting to get out into a community. And in this case, we were singing along with things. And I think this is this pushback against isolation that uh, both of you are talking about uh, and the need for communal practice, social pr practices that connect us with people and get us out of our doldrums. Um, well, both of you are doing such vital work uh, here, uh, uh, Terry, uh, how busy are you? What, what are you seeing? Uh, are you on the road all the time? Well, not all the time because that's just exhausting. Uh, interventions are exhausting events. They really, truly are. But uh, I'm, I'm, after I get through the show, I've got about two hours before I fly a patient out to uh, uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. Did an intervention yesterday and got him prepared, got him agreeable to go and got everything lined up. So I'll be flying out um, uh, this afternoon. Yeah someone to, to treatment but, you go from coast to coast don't you oh yes i've done interventions in seattle and california and taken patients to uh, south florida and Cal and california so yeah anywhere uh yeah i go anywhere i, I want to put up on the screen the uh the sites that you work from so people who can um who want to get hold of you um can either through your your organization the chrysalis interventions uh, dot com or for the book itself you know um i published my review last week and i've already had one person uh write me and say i want to read the book and i i said to the person I, i'll send it to you i'll send you my copy just as soon as the broadcast is over today a person in florida as as a matter of fact um you're pretty you're pretty focused on your congregation there uh, Lauren I guess are you still in school uh, I take master's classes through the Avila Institute online I have not been able to take any for the last uh, couple of quarters but I've got uh, 15 people in my RCIA class right now I've got 150 children who will be making their first communions and Eucharist uh, this coming up I'm had a marriage uh, couples night coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'm hosting a women's conference next month. So <laughs> I've got a lot going on. You're hosting what kind of conference? It's a women's conference. It's called a the Women. Karen Foss Conference. Yes. Now, you have a personal website. Yes. The Contemplative Homemaker. Yes. Dot com. What is that about? It's about how to live uh, a life of constant prayer. Uh, specifically within the home, which is, uh, I think, the most vital organ for living our faith. Um, Jesus spent 30 years in the bonds of a family to prepare for his 
ultimate mission. And so that's where we need to be focusing our efforts. Um, and so my whole blog is about how to pray continually throughout your day. There's some practical pieces about how to uh, live liturgically to bring the church practices alive in your family. So they're not just these uh, esoteric um, theoretical type things, but something physical and sensible that your children can really get, get into. Uh, Terry, you and I both are Baptist pastors. Why is it this lady had to get into the Catholic Church to learn all this? <laughs> you know, Lauren grew up, uh, except for the three years in Murray, she grew up in heavily Catholic territory. And uh, she was born here in Baton Rouge, actually. Yeah. And uh, we spent six years in Houma, Louisiana, which is southwest of New Orleans. Right. And we moved back uh, after Murray to Mobile, which is also a, a heavily Catholic area. So I you know, the Catholic church has always been around us. And she heard me say from the pulpit many times, I used to like to say things like this. I said, if, if you love your Bibles, you Baptist loving uh, uh, Baptist, you thank a Catholic because they, they took care of it 1500 years before you and came along. And I would also say things like the Catholic church is our mother. Uh, you may not always agree with your mother, but you always love her and respect her. So she grew up with that. It was a very, um, not just ecumenical, it was not kind of a gauzy anything goes. It was a, we did come out of this tradition. Yes, we took a, a, a radical turn in, in the Reformation, but we still are indebted to the Catholic Church in some powerful ways. She grew up with that, and it became a way for her, when God called her, to say yes to this, and it was something that at least had some familiarity to her. What a wonderful testimony. I can tell you when I was growing up in Murray, uh, we didn't hear that kind of uh, uh, a warm Catholic uh, conversation from, from the pulpit. But uh, my journey um, into Catholicism, in, in a sense, um, when I was leading the Academy of, of Preachers, I kept telling the um, D Dominican fathers out in St. Louis, I wanted to be a Dominican. Can I can a Protestant be a Dominican? Because they were the order of preachers. Uh, they could not figure out a way to make that happen. But I understand uh, the warm uh, feeling that, that we have. Well, God's blessing on both of you, both in your personal lives and in your ministries. Uh, you're doing such important work and doing it in such a, a powerful way. I want to thank you for being in the meeting house today. Uh, Lauren, uh, uh, you know, when you get those kids potty trained, uh, I, I want to start writing and I want to be the first place that you interview when, when you write your book. All right. Got it. I've been talking to uh, Lauren Ellis DeWitt, Director of Christian Formation at Our Lady of Mercy Catholic Church in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the meeting house today with her father, Terry Ellis, founder of Chrysalis Interventions. Each of them have a website that we have uh, introduced you to. Thank you to both of you. I'll be back in just a minute to wrap up the show for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. You have been in the meeting house where we have a conversation on religion and American life. We've had two very interesting people whose journeys uh, fascinate me. One has written a book about it, Dr. Ellis's book, Reasonably Happy, although it was addiction that triggered his journey uh, in, in this direction. Uh, many of us uh, deal with other types of things for which we need this kind of therapy and inspiration. Um, I want to thank both Terry and his daughter, Lauren, for being with me today. I want to thank my engineers, uh, Alex um, Mattingly in Lexington, Kentucky, and also Everett Armstrong down in Brunswick, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in. I'm always glad to hear from you. Let me know what you think. Write me an email. You can go to my website at TheMeetingHouse.net and uh, uh, send me an email. I will answer it. This program will be posted within 24 hours as a podcast on that side. Thanks to all of you for listening to today. Until we meet again next week, do justice, love mercy, walk with God, and order some coffee. It will make you feel good. God's blessings on all of you. I'm Dwight Moody in the Meeting House. Have a great day.
You have been in the meeting house with host Dwight A. Moody. Thank you for watching or listening today. Visit our website at themeetinghouse.net for more news, reviews, commentaries, and conversation on religion and American life.